What and where is hell? You know, a number of years ago, a friend of mine who does traveling ministry and does presentations just like this, he was doing work at a small town in the south. And he was going to, through uh, from house to house, meeting people and discussing Bible-related things, and he met this young lady at an apartment complex. But as he was talking with her, he noticed that there was something different about this lady. Something about her hair, it, it was different. The, the, the way she, her clothes were, the way her makeup was and her jewelry, he couldn't quite put his finger on it, but it, it was just very different. And as he went on and began to converse with this lady, he found that she had been raised Christian. She said, although, but now I don't go to church. Although, I do sort of. And my friend asked her, can you explain that? What, what do you mean by that statement? And she got right to the point. She, sa she said, John, I was raised in a hellfire brimstone preaching church where God was roasting and toasting and frying people in hell for all of eternity. And then they would go over and over how he would do it again and again, and it would just go on for all of eternity. And I figured if God was like that, then I would just be better off without him. And that's why I don't go to church, although I do sort of. My friend asked her, would you please explain that? What do you mean you go to church, but you, you don't go to church, but you do sort of? And she said, John, I am a witch. He said, what do you mean you're a witch? What do you mean you go to church as a witch? She said, well, I am a part of an organized group of witches, and we get together, we cast spells, we do a lot of things that I'm not going to talk about now, but that's my church. So, yeah, I don't go to church, but I do sort of. That was her church. And so this girl, she went from this little church-going girl to when she grew, grew up becoming a witch. Why? Because of the teaching that God burns sinners in hell forever and ever and ever and ever. You know, not a few times in my own experience, I have met many people who have made the conscious decision to leave God, to leave church, over this idea that God is going to burn people in hell forever and ever and ever. But friends, what does the Bible say? The Bible says God is love. The Bible plainly says that. So will a God of love burn people in hell for all eternity? You know, there's a lot of confusion on this subject. I believe the devil has taken advantage of this, and he has probably caused this subject to cause people to fear and even hate God perhaps more than any other Christian doctrine. And there are really two major teachings on hell within Christianity. The first is unending torment, forever and ever, and the second is annihilation, which is the idea that people eventually are burned up. They are annihilated. Both groups uh, seek to support their beliefs from the Bible, but if, we, if, I, if you know the Bible like I do, you know that the Bible doesn't teach two opposite points of view on the same doctrine, amen? The Bible is a perfect unity, perfect harmony, so it has to be one or the other. Well, here's what some preachers are saying about hell. This is what some preachers are teaching about hell. This quote here says, The smoke of their torment shall ascend up forever in the sight of the blessed. Before their eyes, this display of divine character and glory will be in favor of the redeemed and most entertaining and the highest pleasure to those who love God. Should the eternal torment and fires be extinguished, it would in a great measure put an end to the happiness and glory of the blessed. That's a statement by Dr. Samuel Hopkins. This gentleman is a doctor of theology, has a doctorate in theology. And friends, what do you call an individual who enjoys watching people being tortured for a period? We call those psychopaths. Those people are in our society. We know that they're not safe to be out in society. And so can Jesus be the compassionate, loving Savior he is, and yet still burn people forever? 
Is it possible that there's more to the story here? Can we do something to clear up this picture of God? And could the topic of hellfire actually reveal God's love to us somehow? Well, let's look at some Bible facts about hell. It's, that word is used 54 times in the Bible. In the Old Testament, in the Hebrew, it's the word sheol the most often. And in the Greek, it's most often the word Hades. And we see both have several meanings. When you, the, when you see these words, or these original words, they're not always translated as hell, or they don't always mean a place of burning. For instance, that word sheol, which is often translated as hell, 42 times it's translated as the grave. 42 times the translators chose to translate it as the grave due to its context. Let me show you one of those passages. Job 17 and verse 13. Job says, if I wait in the grave, that's the Hebrew word sheol, it, the grave is mine house. I have made my bed in the darkness. If I wait, the grave is mine house. I have made my bed in the darkness. And there, that word sheol is translated the grave. But notice here in Psalms chapter 16, verse 10, that same word, Sheol, it says, For thou wilt not leave my soul in hell, neither wilt thou suffer thy holy one to see corruption. Now, many of us can identify this. This is a popular passage. It's actually a messianic prophecy. And that same word, Sheol, which was translated grave in Job, here it's being translated as the word hell. And this prophecy pertains to Jesus, and it was predicting the fact that after he died, he would not be dead long enough for his body to start to be corrupted. And his, Jesus rose from the grave before his body sound corruption. And so the main point here is, every time we see the word hell in the Bible, it's not always referring to a place of burning. That word can be translated different ways. Notice this in the New Testament, Revelation chapter 20, verse 13. It says, And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell, that's the word Hades, delivered up the dead which is in them. Now if you look at the margin, the marginal reading will also say, the grave. Now, that's interesting that the marginal reading says that because that perfectly corroborates with where Jesus said the dead were. You remember we looked at this passage uh, yesterday evening? For the hour is coming in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice. So we saw Christ taught that the dead, they are in the graves, and that's in Revelation where people are pictured coming up out of for the time of judgment. And so when we read the word hell, it's not always a place of fire that's being referred to. You have to look at the context, and you have to look at the original language and how it's being used. Now there is another word for hell in the New Testament that is referring to a clear place of burning. That is very clear. It's the word Gehenna. And that word means a place of burning. That is definitely what it's referring to. Twelve times it's used in the New Testament to refer to a place of burning. And it's interesting when you look at the definition of this word. It's of Hebrew origin. And this Greek word Gehenna is a transliteration of the Hebrew word Gehinnom. And that word Gehinnom means the valley of Hinnom. And this was a referencing to a ravine southwest of Jerusalem where Israel, the Jerusalemites, would go and throw their trash away. They would throw carcasses and just their, it was like a dump place. It was like a city dump. And they would continually burn that garbage to consume it, to process the garbage. So there was a continually burning fire there. And it was understood as a place of total destruction and total annihilation. And that's what this word Gehenna is drawing from, that ravine southwest of Jerusalem. Now let me do some review from what we discovered 
yesterday evening. And if you weren't here for yesterday evening, I really encourage you to get a hold of the study guides. It was a very, very central topic. It wasn't a good night to miss. It's a very, very important topic we covered yesterday evening. And we're also going to be having DVDs that we're going to be making available. So I encourage you to try and get a hold of those as well. But yesterday evening, we saw that the Bible teaches that the dead are what the Bible calls asleep. We saw 53 times in the Bible, death is referred to as a state of sleep. And we saw that Jesus taught that the dead are in the grave. The Bible clearly taught in Ecclesiastes 12, 7, the dead know not anything and that they do not return to their homes. Again, please get one of those study guides on the way out. Uh, tonight, I don't have time to recover that topic, but tonight's topic and last night's are connected, so I have to build on that. But please get that study guide on the way out. Now, think about this. If you take the pagan doctrine of an immortal soul, and if you add to that the biblical doctrine of hellfire, you unavoidably end up with an eternally burning hell where the lost are forever tortured. It's the only logical conclusion. And so what we want to find out is, what did Jesus teach about hell? I think we'd be pretty safe if we found that out, amen? What did Christ teach about hell? Well, we want to answer three questions here. We want to answer, when will hellfire burn? Where will hellfire burn? And then, how long also will it burn? Let's deal with that first question. When? When will hellfire burn? Jesus is going to give us the explanation, and he's going to do it through the parable of the wheat and the tares. I hope you have your Bibles, our only textbook. Please turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 13, to the parable of the wheat and the tares. Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13. If you're there, say amen. Okay. Before we get into it, before we start reading, let me give you a little of context. Most of us know this story. The Bible says a man had a field, but while he slept, an enemy came and sowed what? Sowed some tares, the Bible says. And when the servants found out, they were shocked, they were appalled, they turned to their master, they said, hey, should we go and pull up those tares? And notice what the response was. Let's pick it up in verse 29 and 30. Matthew 13, starting in verse 29. I'll put it on the screen in case, in case you didn't bring your Bible. It says, But he said, Nay, or no, lest while you gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let bro both grow together until the harvest... And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares, and bind them in bundles to burn them. But gather the wheat into my barn. So that's Christ's explanation. Well, the disciples, they didn't get it. They gathered around Jesus and they said, We don't understand that. Can you declare unto us the meaning of this parable? What does that all mean? So in verses 37 through 40, Christ explains it to them. Pick it up in verse 37 with me. He says in verse 37, He answered and said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the Son of Man, the field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, the harvest is the end of the world, and the reapers are the angels. As therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be, notice friends, in the end of this world. Very key. Christ's words himself. He says the harvest, that's the end of the world. The tares, that symbol, symbolizes the wicked folks. And when are the tares going to be gathered and burned up according to Jesus? He says it's going to happen in the end of the world. Notice he repeats this, verses 49 and 50. Starting in verse 49, again, I'll put it up for you in case you didn't have your Bible. He says again, starting in verse 49, So shall it be at the end of the world. The angels shall come forth and sever the wicked from among the just, and shall cast them into the furnace of fire. There shall be wailing and gnashing of teeth. 
So according to Jesus, Christ's words, when does hellfire burn the wicked? The end of the world. You know, Jesus' words ought to be proof enough, amen? But let's get another testimony. Let's get another witness. Notice 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Notice what Peter's telling us. He says, you know, God knows how to deliver righteous people, but he also knows how to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So according to Peter, the wicked are reserved unto judgment to be punished. Now you might be scratching your head at this point if you have a different translation. Maybe you're saying, you know, my Bible doesn't quite word it that way. And some translations say it like this. This is the American Standard Version. The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment unto the day of judgment. Okay, that's completely different. Being reserved unto judgment is different than being punished until the day of judgment. And I find that about half the translations word it like the King James. They say reserved unto judgment. And the other half of the translations say it like this, are kept under punishment until the day of judgment. As a matter of fact, if you look at the Aramaic Plain English Bible, uh, it's very explicit. The Lord Jehovah knows to deliver from suffering those who reverence him, but he keeps the evil for the day of judgment while they're being tormented. Now, let's just reason, let's just think about this a little bit. How much sense does this make? Imagine someone is accused of a crime and the police say, you know what, we're going to chain you up and we're going to whip you until we figure out whether to punish you or not. Does that make much sense? If you're already being whipped, you're already being punished. Absolutely. What's to wait for? You've been judged. The sentence might as well have been pronounced. There's nothing to wait for. So how do we clear this up? How do we know which version to go with? The context is going to share us uh, share the answer with us. Notice in verse 4, 2 Peter 2 and verse 4, God gives us another example. It says, if, For if God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down, notice to where? To hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. Okay, first of all, where does, it, where does this passage say the, the, the angels that sinned are, the demons? says they're in hell. That's very interesting. Not just that. Notice it also says they are reserved unto judgment. So the evil angels are an example of those who are reserved unto judgment. And that word hell there, it's actually a very different Greek word for hell. It's the word Tataris. And it's only used at this one place in the New Testament, and it means a place of darkness. A place of darkness. Let me ask you, friends, the demons, you think they're in a place of darkness? Absolutely they are. Spiritually, the demons are in a place of darkness. And the Bible calls the wicked even the children of darkness, or the children of the light, or of night. And the righteous Christians are the children of the day. And so the demons are an example of those who the Bible says are being reserved unto judgment. Let me ask you, are demons burning in hellfire right now? No, they're not. And we see examples of that in Scripture. Uh, I could tell you, I have talked to many, many people who have, had, who have spoken to them, who have had physical interactions with them. I had an ex-girlfriend one time that was in a room all by herself and was picked up and thrown across the room by a demon. And so they are alive and active. And notice also something about the Christ interaction with them. This is a very insightful passage here. Christ was going to cast out demons, Matthew 8, 29. And behold, they cried out, saying, What have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou Son of God? Notice, art thou come hither to torment us before the time? So according to this, the demons were accusing Jesus, are you here to fast forward our time of torments before the time? So are the demons being tormented in hell right now? No, they're not. 
They accuse Christ of coming to do that. So the demons are not in hell right now. And according to the Bible, the demons are those who are, are an example of those who are reserved unto judgment. And they're not burning in hell right now. Therefore, neither are the wicked dead because the Bible says both of them are reserved unto judgment. The demons are reserved unto judgment. The wicked who are dead are reserved unto judgment. The demons aren't burning in hell right now. Neither are the wicked dead. So apparently, when the Bible says reserved, it actually means reserved. That's what it's talking about. And again, an answer from Jesus always ought to suffice. John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Christ says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, future, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So two different resurrections, and Christ clearly pictures the dead in the grave. Now, the Bible also pictures both the good and the bad coming up in resurrections to receive different rewards. So in summary, when, when will hell fire burn? Christ's words were very clear. He said, it will happen, the tares will be gathered and thrown into the fire at the end of this world. And we're also told after the resurrection of damnation. So when will hell fire burn? The Bible states, at the end of the world. Therefore, when we understand the plain words of Jesus, how many people are burning in hell right now? The conclusive evidence is absolutely zero. No one's burning in hell right now. Christ said that hell will burn, but when's it going to happen? At the end of this world, he says. So I hope that's perhaps comforting to someone out there, comforting to some of you. Now, what about where? Where will hellfire burn? What will be the location? Notice Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 and 10. Please turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 and 10. We want to answer the question, where? And in case you didn't bring your Bible, I will put it up on the slide for you. Revelation chapter 14, verse 9 and verse 10. It says... If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone. Notice where, friends, in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Did the Bible say that the wicked will be tormented in a cavern somewhere in the center of the earth? It's not what it said. It said right in the presence of the angels and right in the presence of the Lamb. Who's the Lamb? That's Jesus. It's going to happen right in front of them. And so where is it going to burn? The Bible is going to give us some more evidence as to exactly where this is. Notice 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 7. It says, But the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, notice what the heavens and the earth are, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So what also is being reserved unto the day of judgment for fire? According to this passage, the heavens and the earth is an example of something that's being reserved unto judgment, being reserved unto fire on the day of judgment. So the Bible states that the earth will be the location of hellfire. That hellfire will take place right here on planet earth. And when it happens, it's going to happen right in the presence of the angels and the Lamb. Notice also Proverbs 11, verse 31. It says, Behold, the righteous will be recompensed. That means to be rewarded in this earth. Much more the wicked and the sinner. So the Bible states that the righteous, they're rewarded. They're recompensed where? Here on planet earth. How much more or much more, the Bible says, the wicked. So both the righteous and the wicked get their rewards where? Right here on planet earth. And so the Bible teaches that both the righteous and the wicked get their reward here. Now, so summary, 
Where will hellfire burn? It's going to burn right here on planet Earth, and this will become clear as we go along. Now let's deal with probably the most controversial of all the questions: How long will hellfire burn? How long? And this question here has generated definitely the most controversy on this topic, and because of a few. Generally misunderstood Bible passages. The devil has been able to use it to paint God with his own qualities. But how long? In short, the Bible doesn't tell us exactly long for sure. We don't know exactly how long hellfire will, will burn for. But the Bible tells us clearly that the wicked are punished according to their works. That's, that's what Christ says. Notice also the words of Jesus in Luke 12:47 and 48. He says, "The servant which knew his lord's will, and neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knoweth not and did commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes." So the Bible teaches that there are going to be degrees of punishment. Those who understood, they knew what God told them to do, and they chose not to do it anyways. Many stripes. Those who didn't fully understand, but they still did things worthy of stripes, few stripes. There will be degrees of punishment. The Bible says. Now this ought to make sense to us. Think about it, friends. People like this guy right here. Do you think he should get a more severe punishment than maybe Joe Smith down the street who just never really accepted Jesus and? Didn't commit any huge crimes, but just didn't want anything to do with God. Do you think he should get a more severe punishment, Hitler, than Joe Smith down the street? Absolutely, that makes perfect sense to us. And so there will be degrees of punishment, probably in intensity and also in duration. And you know who's going to burn the longest? Satan. The devil was going to burn the longest. The instigator of sin. Period. How long? We don't know exactly sure how long, but one thing is certain: we're going to see that hellfire will not burn through the ceaseless ages of eternity. I want to give you three reasons right now that we can be certain that hellfire cannot burn through the ceaseless ages of eternity. Reason number one: the Bible says that hellfire will burn on earth, yet the earth is going to be the home of the saved. The Bible says. Notice from the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew five verse five, it says, "Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit where? They shall inherit the earth." Now, what kind of an earth are they going to inherit? A lava boiling, erupting planet Earth? Is that the inheritance of the righteous? No, they're going to inherit a beautiful planet, not a fiery, burning Earth. Notice also Second Peter chapter three, verses twelve and thirteen. The heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. That's Peter referring to what's going to happen here on planet Earth when hellfire takes place. Nevertheless, we, according to His promise, look for a new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. And so, after talking about this world exploding with fire. Peter says we're looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth afterwards, and so friends, the wicked can't keep living here, being punished eternally on planet Earth. Why? Because the earth eventually is going to be the home of the saved, the home of the righteous, and there's not going to be some burning portion of heaven of this new earth the Bible speaks about that's going to disturb or smog up that beautiful inheritance of the saved. That's reason number one. Reason number two. Because God is just and fair. Notice what it says in Psalms 145, verse 17: "The Lord is righteous in how many of His ways, friends? In all His ways and holy in all His works." God is fair with every single thing that He does. Even when God punishes, God is fair, even in punishing. And friends, a forever burning hell is not fair. Think about this: someone who had a life of 70 years of sin and rebellion and not wanting anything to do with God, getting punished for all of eternity. I mean, think about that. It never ever will end. 
is simply not fair. We have this idea in our understanding that the punishment must be equal to the crime. Does that make sense? So let's say you're driving down Highway 1 here, and you go one mile above the speed limit. The police officer pulls you over and says, yep, got to ticket you one mile above the speed limit. Oh, besides that, you got to go to prison for life. Does that seem a little bit drastic? Life in prison for one mile above the speed limit? You'd probably want to hire an attorney at that point, right? And plead your case in court and saying, wait, this is out of control. There's no way I should be going to jail for life for one mile over the speed limit. It's because we have this understanding, and rightly so, that the punishment ought to be equal to the crime. Therefore, it for someone to be living a life of 60, 70, 80, even 90, 100 years of sin, to receive a punishment that lasts all eternity defies logic, friends. It is not fair. And by the way, I do want to mention at this point, it's also not fair for God to let sinners go unpunished, period. God is merciful, amen? But the Bible also says he's just. And there will be a just sentence for sinners. Now, where did this, the teaching of eternal burning torment originate from? Remember, we looked at this last night. Where did eternal burning torment come from, this doctrine of hell? Notice it really spawns from the devil's first lie. This idea that the devil himself, himself told Eve in the garden. That's where hellfire spawned from. And what was that lie? He said, you shall not surely die. You shall not surely die. And eternal hell is based on the belief of the soul never being able to be destroyed. The soul being immortal. Remember we saw passage by passage in the Bible saying that we're not, we're not immortal. We are mortal and we don't receive immortality until the resurrection, until the second coming of Jesus. When this mortal shall put on immortality and this corruption will be swallowed up by incorruption essentially is what it says. And so that's what it's based on. Now, some have gone to the other extreme, and they can't believe that God is going to punish people at all, and that hell doesn't even exist. This is another extreme that we see happening out there. The U.S. News and Report actually picked up on this idea and made a comical uh, cover from it. But will God save everybody? Is that how it's going to work out? And the Bible's really clear. There will be a punishment. And one large church even created a place called purgatory where people kind of go and sizzle for a little bit preparatory to getting into heaven if they weren't quite good enough to make it directly into heaven. Why? Because the parishioners had such a difficult time with this idea of an unending hell. And friends, I would like to submit that this doctrine of a forever burning hell has created more atheists than probably any other doctrine in Christianity. And you know, there's only one person who really delights in seeing people suffer eternally. And it's not God. It's the devil. It's Satan. Our third point here, our third reason, eternal life is only promised to the saved. Notice we're given two choices. John chapter 3 verse 16. It says, whosoever should believe in him should not perish, option one, but have everlasting life, option two. Friends, we have two choices, don't we? The Bible says we have two. Perish, on one hand, or everlasting life, on the other hand. The Bible clearly says the wages of sin is death. That's what the Bible clearly teaches. Not the wages of sin is a really bad, long, long life. That's not what it said. It said it's death, and death is the absence of life. It's contrasted with life. And you look in the Bible, the wicked are never promised life by God. Never, friends. They're never promised to live eternally. Search. Check it out. They're never promised that, but they are promised eternal death. That's what they're promised by God if they choose to stubbornly persist in the path of sin. Another passage, Ezekiel 18.4. He says, The soul that sinneth, it shall live forever in a really bad place. It shall die. Plainly teaches, it shall die. And if the wicked live eternally in the fires of hell, then think about it, they have a very similar gift as the righteous. Eternal life. Just a really bad version of eternal life. 
But the Bible, God never promises the wicked eternal life. The righteous are promised eternal life. The wicked are promised death. Now, this is where, for me, it gets really, really clear. How does the Bible state the wicked are going to perish? Psalms 37, verses 9 and 10. Notice it says, For evildoers shall be cut off, but those that wait upon the Lord, they shall inherit the earth. There's that beautiful promise again. For yet a little while, and the wicked, notice, shall not be. Yea, thou shalt diligently consider his place, and it shall not be. It goes on. But the wicked shall perish, and the enemies of the Lord shall be as the fat of lambs. Notice, they shall consume into smoke, they sh and shall they consume away. The Bible says the wicked, they're going to consume up. They're going to consume into smoke. You're going to diligently consider their place. Where are they? Where are they? And they shall not be. That's how the Bible puts it. Notice Malachi chapter 4 verse 1 corroborates perfectly with what we just read. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and the proud, yea, all that do wickedly, shall be as what? Stubble. And that day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. So the Bible teaches when the wicked suffer that fate of eternal death, they will be burned up. They will be like stubble, the Bible says. It goes on. Verse 3. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be as what? Ashes under the soles of your feet. In that day I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. The Bible teaches that the wicked God's consuming fires are going to do their job. They're going to burn up the wicked and they will be as ashes. Have you ever tried to light ashes on fire? Ashes don't light on fire, do they? You know why? Because the fire has already done its purging work. The Bible uses ashes as a symbol, a type to understand what the final judgment is going to be like. And notice it said it would burn them up root and branch. You know, if you didn't get the root, the plant might come up again, right? It says root and branch. There will be no remaining trace. The tree will not come back. What about the devil? What's going to happen to him? The prophet Ezekiel tells us. Ezekiel 28, verses 18 and 19. It says, thou, ha thou hast defiled thy sanctuaries by the multitude of thine iniquities. Therefore, I will bring forth a fire from the midst of thee, and it shall devour thee. What does that mean when something's devoured? It's consumed. It's burned up. It's been completely devoured. It, it doesn't exist anymore. Have you ever been so hungry you devoured a whole plate of food? That plate of food ceased to exist. You, you just made it disappear. You put it in your stomach. The devil is going to be devoured, friends. He is going to burn up. Oops. Notice it gets very clear. And I will bring thee to ashes. The devil also is going to turn to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all them that behold thee. Notice the righteous are going to be watching. Remember it said in the presence of the Lamb and the angels? In the sight of all that behold thee. This is very clear. And never shalt thou be any more. I'm not sure how God could have put it more positive, friends. The devil's going to consume to ashes to the point where you're not going to exist anymore. Never shalt thou be any more. I think that's good news, amen? I would look forward to a universe where the devil doesn't even exist. He consumes away. He will not exist anymore. That's the testimony of what the prophets are telling us here. Now, perhaps you're thinking, I hear what you're saying, but boy, what do you do about those passages that talk about forever and ever? I mean, they're plainly there in the Bible. How do you deal with those? Let's look at those this is uh, one that we actually read already, a well-known passage. It says, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. The Bible does say that. Now, does forever and ever mean eternally every time it's used? We kind of think it does. We assume it does. But the Bible often uses terms different than we assume sometimes. The answer is actually no. Forever in the Bible is a relative term. I'm going to show you this in just a second. 
And it's relative like, like the word tall. The word tall is a relative term. If we're referring to men, tall would be seven feet, right? That's a tall guy. If we're referring to trees, tall would be 70 feet. If we're referring to mountains, it would be 7,000 feet, right? See how that word tall is relative, dependent on what it's referring to. Forever is used the same way in the Bible. It can mean different lengths of time, depending on what it's referring to, depending on the context. Let's look at some examples of this. Exodus 21, and before I read this, this is regarding a servant who would choose to serve his master. They had a ceremony that they went through in ancient Israel. It says, Then his master shall bring him, that's the servants, unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, or unto the post, door posts. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl, and he shall serve him, how long? Forever. Let me ask you, those servants that went through this ritual, there was no doubt multitudes of them, are they still serving their masters in ancient Israel right now? No. So forever in this instance, it meant the rest of his life. The rest of his life. That's what forever in this context means. Because we're seeing it's used as a relative term depending on what it applies to. Notice also when Hannah came to dedicate Samuel at the temple, we see the same thing. 1 Samuel 1.22, But Hannah went not up, for she said unto her husband, I will not go up until the child be weaned, and then I will bring him, that he may appear before the Lord, and there abide, how long? Forever. Let me ask you, is Samuel still at the temple over in the Middle East serving the Lord? No. So her forever here, also, it was uh, a time frame which really was meaning the rest of his life. And the Bible brings us out just in plain, plain words here. Hannah letter, later says in verse 28 of that same chapter, Therefore also I have lent him to the Lord as long as he liveth. So we see forever is being used as, as long as he lived, the, the rest of his life. It was a relative term in ancient times. Okay, let's look at one more example. Let's look at Jonah. Now, you all know the, st the story of Jonah. Jonah was a naughty prophet. He ran from God. He got in a ship. A big, huge storm came, and the sailors cast lots, and it fell on Jonah, and they said, hey, who's your God? And he said, well, the God that made the heavens, the earth, and the ocean. They said, well, you got us in trouble, didn't you? And uh, Jonah said, toss me over the boats. The storm will stop. They tossed him over, and the Bible says a great fish swallowed him up. Perhaps it was a whale. And when the Bible says that it swallowed him up, Jonah wrote about that experience in the book of Jonah. Notice he says, chapter 2, verse 6, I went down to the bottoms of the mountains. The earth with her bars was about me. How long? Forever. And then he brings up, we know how long Jonah was in the belly of that fish. Forever, it says, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days, three nights. So, in reference to Jonah, in the belly of the well, how long was forever? Three days, three nights. It's a relative term in Scripture. Now, there are places in Scripture where forever does mean for eternity, but not every place that forever is used in the Bible does it mean for the eternal ages. For instance, the Bible says that the redeemed are going to be in heaven forever. In that context, absolutely, it means eternity, but not every place in Scripture. So bottom line here, forever and ever is a relative biblical expression, which means unto the end of the age, not necessarily an infinite, unending length of time. As a matter of fact, in the New Testament, the Greek word is uh, aeon and aeon. That means for age of ages. It's a relative term that can, that's flexible. It could mean lots of different time frames. And so for the wicked, forever means as long as their moral natures can survive the fire which punishes them according to their works. Because the Bible teaches that they're punished according to their works. Okay, now what about the unquenchable fire of Mark chapter 9? What does that mean? Now, to quench a fire means to do what? It means to put it out, right? To put out that fire. Now, if the wicked could quench hell... That means they could get out of there, right? They could escape it. And so 
Is God going to start a fire that he himself can't put out? Does that sound like God to you? Starts a fire, oh, this is out of control. I don't know what I'm going to do. Friends, God could put out the fires he starts. So unquenchable fire is a fire that can not be put out by anyone but God. Only God can put it out. Did you know, by the way, that the Bible says that Jerusalem was destroyed with unquenchable fire? Look it up. Jeremiah 17, 27. Jerusalem was destroyed with unquenchable fire. And friends, is Jerusalem still burning today? Not burning today, but it's an example of unquenchable fire. So to sum up this point, hellfire will be unquenchable because no one will be able to put it out or escape from it. But when it has accomplished its purpose of consuming the wicked, it will go out just as the unquenchable fire that destroyed Jerusalem eventually went out. That's the message that Scripture is trying to convey. Notice also uh, about everlasting fire. It's a very similar situation. The terms eternal or everlasting fire. What does the Bible mean when it says that? Let the Bible choose or let the Bible define this for us. Jude 7. Jude, there's only one chapter, verse 7. Notice what it says. Even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of what? Eternal fire. Friends, is Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? No. We know that it's not. We know that it was that it was burned up and that it was reduced to ashes. That city was burned up. And they are set forth in Scripture as an example of those that suffer eternal fire. That's the example given us in Scripture. Well, what about in Matthew 25, 46, where it says the wicked will receive everlasting punishment? Let's look at that passage, Matthew 25, 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishments, but the righteous into life eternal. Okay, now let's notice something immediately right here. Notice here that everlasting punishment is contrasted with what other experience? Life eternal. It's contrasted with it. So this everlasting punishment is opposite. It's contrast with living forever, eternal life. And also notice it says everlasting punishment. It didn't say everlasting punishing. Everlasting punishing would be the process of being punished forever and ever, but everlasting punishment is one act, to receive a punishment. So everlasting in effect, also not in duration. This is another important point. The, the consequence, the, the reward of the wicked, which is death, is that going to last through the ceaseless ages of eternity? Yes, that is going to be everlasting. So the everlasting part is in the effect, not the duration. They will be dead forever. That's what it means by everlasting punishment. Their punishment is death. That's going to continue forever. Well, again, what about that passage that talks about the undying worm? We find that in Mark 9, verse 43. It says, And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that shall never be quenched, where their worm dieth not, and the fire is not quenched. Okay, what is this bringing out? What, what does this mean? This place where their worm dies not. Now, never been, never been quenched, or can never be quenched. We already dealt with that. God can quench it, but he won't. The wicked will not be able to quench it. They won't be able to escape it. No one's getting out of that fire till it runs its course. But this worm that dieth not. First of all, let's ask ourselves a question. What are worms doing in hell? Isn't that interesting? And second, how come these worms aren't being consumed? Are they super worms? What is the Bible trying to convey here? Well, remember that example, Gehenna, the valley of Hinnom, referring to that ravine southwest of Jerusalem where they would throw their dump and their waste and they were continually burning a fire there. Well, you know, they would throw carcasses in there and all kinds of things. You know, not all of the stuff 
was getting burned. Some of the carcasses, some of the trash around the edges were not yet being consumed. So there was worms there, there were maggots there, like you would expect at any dump place. And so this idea of these undying worms, that would take the mind of the Jewish listener back to that valley southwest of Jerusalem, the valley of Hinnom, where they saw worms there all the time, year after year after year. And so this is the terminology that it's deriving from. And that place was understood as a place of total destruction, a place of annihilation. And, you know, uh, a pastor friend of mine, he shared all this information with another pastor friend of his who was teaching this. And the pastor friend who was teaching this version of an eternal burning hell, uh, he remarked on this and he says, you know, I know what you're sharing is true. And my friend who was sharing what I'm sharing with you tonight said, then why do you keep teaching it? He said, listen, if I stopped teaching a forever burning hell, people would stop coming to my church. Friends, should we really be teaching that to get people to come to church? Scaring folks into that. And you know what? As we wrap this up, there's something really important that we want to remember about God. Notice what it says in Ezekiel 33, 11. Say unto them, as I live, saith the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn ye, turn ye from your evil way, for why will you die, O house of Israel? Friends, does Jesus enjoy punishing the wicked? Does Jesus enjoy the death of wicked people? The Bible says no. I have no pleasure in that, Jesus says. I don't desire that whatsoever, but what I do desire is that the wicked would turn from their wicked ways. What I desire is that they would turn and that they would receive eternal life. So he says, turn ye, turn ye, why will ye die, O house of Israel? Why will you die? When eternal life is made so abundant, why will you die? That's what the Lord is saying here. No pleasure in the death of the wicked. And you know what, friends? One of the saddest things about the destruction of the wicked is not just that they do get destroyed, but also why. Why they will be in that place of torment. Why will they, they will be in that place of fire. The trivial things, the useless, trivial things that people give up heaven for because of a TV show, because of a relationship, because of money, because of a job, because of an addiction, because of anything that God says, that's not my will for you, child. And they said, I want to do it anyways. And cut off themselves from the source of eternal life. One of the saddest things about the end and about the destruction of the wicked is the trivial things people gave up heaven for. It's one of the saddest things. Notice Isaiah 28, 21. For the Lord shall rise up that he may do his work, his strange work, and bring to pass his strange act. In reference to the destruction of the wicked, it is called, it is considered a strange act, a strange work. Do you know why it's such so strange? It's because Jesus, through all, all eternity, has been a creator, creating, creating, creating. And now he has to take away life. Now he has to destroy it's a strange thing for him. The Bible calls it a strange act. In the year 1830, George Wilson, a man by the name of George Wilson, was convicted of robbing the U.S. mail and was sentenced to be hung. President Andrew Jackson actually issued a pardon for Mr. Wilson and Mercy. When they came to the jail and delivered the pardon to Mr. Wilson, believe it or not, he rejected it. He rejected the pardon. He would not receive it. Well, the matter eventually came to the Chief Justice Marshal, and this is what he said. They recorded it in the Kansas City Times. A pardon is a slip of paper, the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If it is refused, it is no pardon. George Wilson must be hanged. You know, when you really think about it, the wicked are going to be punished not so much because of their crime, but because they rejected pardon, friends. 
In the end, we don't have to perish because of our sins, because Jesus took care of sin on the cross, amen? If sin's your problem, it doesn't have to be a problem because Jesus took care of that. But why people are going to perish in the end is because they refused, they rejected pardon. That's why people are going to perish in the end. And friends, God has made every provision for humanity to be saved. He has done all that he can. What more could God do to save us? He came and he suffered. He died. He pleads. He draws on us. He offers us forgiveness. He endures us day after day after day. How long did Jesus have to endure you before you gave your life to Jesus? How much of uh, your stuff did Jesus endure and put up with? I tell you, I don't think I'd have the patience to put up with what I gave to God. He's drawn on us and he's been patient and merciful to us. And what more could God do? You know, the Bible has a beautiful truth that in the end, someday, God is going to create a new heavens and a new earth. After those purifying fires of hell go out, it says in Revelation 21 verse 4, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. I love the fact, it says in Nahum 1-7, affliction shall not rise up the second time. That's a beautiful promise, friends. We're not, and through the ceaseless ages of eternity, we're not going to have to worry. Oh, is sin going to come up again? Is someone going to decide to do what Lucifer did in heaven? Is someone going to decide to rebel and, and refuse Jesus? We're not going to have to worry about that. It's not going to come up a second time. And friends, if you think about it, a forever burning hell would perpetuate sin. A forever burning hell would perpetuate suffering. And God is not interested in perpetuating sin. He's interested in eliminating sin. Amen? God is not interested in perpetuating suffering. He's interested in eliminating suffering. That's why it says he'll wipe away all tears. There'll be no more crying, no more suffering. Pain will be passed. And you know who the Bible says hell is actually prepared for? Notice this. Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye accursed, into everlasting fire. Prepared for who? Prepared for the devil and his angels. Do you realize that hellfire was not prepared for human beings? It was not God's intention that humans should end up there. It's prepared for the devil and his angels. And if any human being end up there, it was not because it was God's design or purpose. Hellfire was not meant for humans. Not one has to end up there. In the Bible, Jesus presents to us two options, perish or everlasting life. And he's pleading with us, choose life. Choose life. Paul says, lay hold of eternal life. Friends, grab onto eternal life and never, ever let it go. Amen? The devil is trying to get us to let go of that eternal life, to get distracted with the things of this world, and so that we would miss out on that eternal prize that Jesus paid a priceless, priceless price for. Is it your decision to choose that today? Maybe you've been choosing eternal life for a long time. Praise God, choose it again. But maybe there's someone, maybe just one person in here, who has never made that decision. Maybe there's someone in here who's never said, you know, I've never made the conscious decision to say yes to Jesus. I want to serve you. I want to give my life to you. I choose eternal life. If it's your decision, whether it's the first time or the 1,000th first time, right where you are, just raise your hand. Say, I choose eternal life. I choose Jesus Christ. Hellfire wasn't prepared for me. I don't have to end up there. Raise your hand and say, I choose Jesus. Let him know this evening. Praise the Lord. Praise God. May God keep that which you've committed. Let's bow our heads. Let's have a word of prayer together. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, thank you for sharing with us this study. Though it's an unfortunate topic to have to speak about, it is the truth. We thank you, Lord, that you have promised that though this ugly sin issue has popped up in this world, you're going to take care of it. You've made it as much as possible as you can to provide salvation, to provide pardon for each and every human being. And I pray there would not be one who's here at this meeting this evening 
that would choose to not receive that precious gift, that would choose to step out of the light of your truth. I ask and I pray that you would bless each and every one, that you would be with us, that we would all be in that wonderful new earth, that new heavens that you speak about, that we would receive that immortal crown that you told us you have laid up for us. Please be with us, Lord. Help us to not lose that crown. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, friends. Sunday at 6.30, we're going to discover how to survive the last day crisis. That's tomorrow evening. And then Tuesday at 6.30, don't miss it. We're going to talk about the mark of the beasts. God bless you. And if you've been blessed, don't forget to share what you've learned. Have a good evening.